from time to time at the CY, we like to take a, a break from regular learning and uh, take a look at some of the larger pictures of the implications of the subjects we're learning and uh, anything tangential to them. We did that a couple times last year, and I hope we'll do it a couple times this year. Sometimes we do it with Chabruta. I felt that um, the material that we're learning that Chibruta and Shir would kind of be just a uh, Chazara over in Shir, and the material, the, the sources are pretty straightforward. I have one, oh, I had one more sheet. Um, so, if people need more sheets, maybe someone can run upstairs and make a couple more photocopies of them. And I am currently out of sheets. And if you can't find them on Safari, ask, uh, ask your neighbor. Um, and one of the, um, one of the topics that sort of rolls around in my head periodically, um, both in terms of learning some of the material and also in experience, uh, in what, especially what goes on in America, um, with the issue of using non-Jews to perform uh, Jewish labor on Shabbat. Uh, I will pull Basham use the word goy. Please don't take offense at the word goy. Goy originally is just the word for non-Jew. It kind of, I think, got a negative connotation in certain circles. But I don't think in classical circles goy has any uh, negative connotation. It just means non-Jew. Uh, and the term Shabbos Goy or Goy Shal Shabbat is a frequent term that you see in, um, in rabbinic literature. When are you allowed to use non-Jews to do Jewish labor? Uh, just a few personal stories that sort of uh, have irked me recently and more historically. Uh, in the synagogue I grew up in, my father was the cantor. <clears throat> wonderful man, but uh, uh, when we would get to shul and I would come to shul with him in the morning, there was the janitor who was usually black, and my dad would say, turn this on, turn this on, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, and I, I just made, didn't make, I know it's not publicly particularly acceptable, but it does seem that that is often what is done, at least in shuls that I have experienced, um, in many conservative shuls, which is most of my experience. Um, in the shul I work in in Toronto, there are um, uh, non-Jews doing all sorts of work, um, some of which I would say are absolutely essential, such as security. Uh, unfortunately, there is some need for security, and I'll, we'll talk a little bit about that at some point. Um, not security, but the use of non-Jews for essential labor. Um, and some of which is just not, this not essential at all, and, and therefore um, has led me to a couple arguments with the full-time rabbi, where I think that what we're doing is wrong, but uh, I'm just a visitor there, so I always lose those arguments. Um, but I wanted to take a step back and uh, think not just about the particular institute that came over the centuries to be known as, in English, the Shabbos Goy or the Goy Shal Shabbat, but to look back a little bit at the central message of Shabbat, because there's some sort of paradox in the entire Institute of Shabbat about the universality of Shabbat. And when we look at the text, I think we can see how, how prominent that paradox is. Um, and we're going to look at a whole bunch of texts about this, and I'm going to try to um, present two sort of visions of Shabbat, one more universal and one more particular, and then maybe talk a little bit about how that plays out in our lives. Uh, and not just in terms of Shabbat, but I think it could be applied to other aspects of Judaism as well. I don't have a solution for all of these issues, but at least something to start thinking about. Um, the first place that Shabbat is mentioned, the first text on your sheet, uh, is clearly, obviously, everybody should know this, is Breshit. God uh, creates the world in six days and on the seventh day rests. Uh, and God blesses the seventh day and sanctifies it for God stopped working on the seventh day. Now, it doesn't exactly say there, and therefore you shall stop working on the seventh day. Uh, it doesn't really say that until, uh, until uh, the Ten Commandments and Exodus. But I think the, the implication seems to be quite clear and will become clear as time goes along. The implication being that just as God created the world and worked created for six days and rested on the seventh day, so too you should work for seven days, do creative activities for six days, excuse me, and rest on the seventh day. It's a very clear message. And it is very universal. Uh, this comes up in Breshi, the first story in Breshi. 
uh, and reading the shot of that story, it has nothing to do with being the Israelites, with being God's chosen people, with particular mitzvot. It's just the way of the world. Uh, now, scholars argue, historical scholars can argue about whether or not the Israelites, the Torah, was the first, were the first people to introduce the concept of a seven-day work week with one day off. Uh, there are some biblical scholars who think that Jews brought that, or Israelites brought that to the world. There are some who think that they didn't. Um, that doesn't really matter to me so much as, in reality, in the end, uh, even if there were some Babylonians or Persians here or there who brought the notion of a seven-day week with one day off to the world, it didn't reach the rest of the world directly through those proto-Babylonians or whoever they may have been. The notion of a seven-day week uh, with six days of work and one day off reached the world through the Jews and eventually through the Christians and, and subsequent uh, other religions that were related or came forth from Judaism. Uh, and many modern scholars, uh, when, uh, when they're considering the meaning of Shabbat, they address it in a very, very universal kind of way. So I brought a couple quotes on your sheets here. It's on the page there. Uh, I think, the, just so you know, the Safari sheet has more quotes than the paper here. So I'm looking at the paper. There's a quote from Rabbi uh, Jonathan Sachs, um, who writes very beautifully, as he often does. Despite attempts of historians to trace a connection to the Babylonian calendar, the Sabbath was an unprecedented innovation. It meant that one day in seven, all hierarchies of wealth and power were suspended. Uh, he also notes in another quote that the Greeks and Romans were frankly perplexed. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, Seneca said it was because Jews were idle that they devoted a seventh of their time to rest. This is, this is true. The Greeks uh, did, and we'll talk again as we get to the uh, rabbinic sources, the Greeks did not have a notion of one day a week of rest. Such a notion didn't exist. Now they had already by this period a notion of a week. But they didn't have any notion that one day had to be a day of rest. I suppose that Greeks and Romans, those who were wealthy enough, rested whenever they wanted to. And those who were slaves and those who were poor basically had to work as often as they possibly could. Uh, there was no such thing as a, as a day of rest. Um, Heschel talks about it in the very beginning of his very, very famous book, The Sabbath. Um, just the end of that quote, the solution of mankind's most vexing problem will not be found in renouncing technical civilization, but in attaining some degree of independence of it. Uh, and I think that that's when we conceive often, as modern Jews, when we conceive of Shabbat, we think of it in very universal terms. What does it mean for us as human beings to cease creating, to cease traveling, to cease working, to cease doing all the things that we're doing and take one day and set it aside to something else, be it worship, uh, be it study, be it family, be it community. Uh, we think of ourselves very, I think, that this is something that is desirable, beneficial for all human beings. Uh, and throughout Heschel's book, I think most of it probably could be applied to all human beings, uh, not just something particularly Jewish about which we say, well, this is good for us, but it is not necessarily something I think the rest of the world has to share with. We think of it as a value in terms of the universe. And that, I think, is the original, at least, let's say, both the introduction to Shabbat in the Torah and the way that we conceive of it um, in a cert, to a certain extent, in our philosophical, our thinking kinds of lives. Right, maybe stop there for a comment, the introduction to it. Any thoughts yet? I don't want to, don't want to lecture for an hour, an hour and a half. It's too long. But so please, if you want to... Yeah. I'm curious about the way that this, the idea of the Torah is when Shabbat is an experience as a minority group mm. versus Shabbat is an experience of the majority culture. You, are you, are you at uh, a Shabbat? Where are you talking about thinking about Shabbat as a majority culture? Israel. Like Israel. <laughs> okay. Um, so I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't remember. I read Heschel's full book a long time ago. Um, 
And um, I don't know how to answer that question. I don't know what he talks about. Um, it might be an interesting overall question in relation to whether Shabbat is universal or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. on, a on a sociological level. Right. Like, certainly for me, Shabbat is very different as a majority culture experience versus a minority culture experience. Right. I think it does have to do with the, like, the universal so, question, too. So I just wanted right. to that. Right. So let, let me, let's see. I think that that's getting into what you're, what, like, into a more particular version of what sh what it means to keep Shabbat. And I want to... Let's 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 we'll think about that. We'll maybe come back to that. I certainly think it's something I haven't really thought about yet. Um, the difference between experiencing Shabbat. I mean, the, the extreme would be experiencing Shabbat relatively on your own with no one around. Not just a minority culture that has a community, but alone in a hotel in the middle of some downtown area where there's no one around for miles. There's just something on my mind because I have friends who travel for business and sometimes they're stuck in a hotel. Uh, in the business area, I don't know, Los Angeles, for instance, where there's just not much of a community around. That's the, the height of the minority culture. That's a minority of one. Minority cultures may vary from a small community to a large community to, to other types of minority cultures. But let's, let's maybe think about that. I hadn't really thought of that before. Any other thoughts about the universality? So to go along with that, it seems plausible that maybe the Jews introduced Sabbath. Yeah. Is the argument also that they introduced the seven day week, or is that so? Or? So that's that's I think part of what he's talking about there too. The seven day week, right, is the only time period that we observe that's not tied to any astronomical feature. It's completely human made. Uh, the year, the day, and the month, our other major units, are all tied to various astronomical features that we can see in the sky. The seven day week is artificial. It's humanly created. Um, and there's an interesting twist over there because we consider it to be God created the Kadesh HaShabbat, uh, that God created the seventh day. Um, but in reality, and we're gonna see some of this, it's very anti-natural. Now again, I don't know, there may be other cultures out there that did have a seven day week. I don't think that that's really the big issue. The big issue is that the Jews, through these verses, are the, and, and through eventually through Christianity, are the ones who brought at least the day of rest. And I, I'm not sure about the seven day week. Um, this is a question for anyone who knows. I don't know if anyone yeah. knows, but it seems to me that the universality question might be quite Western centric. And I'm not sure what it yeah. looks like in East Asia and the, sub, uh, the Indian subcontinent. Yeah. I mean, they're very Western, good, they've been westernized um, in terms of they've been forced to adopt the yeah. Julian calendar, and they yeah. have the week, but Thank what you. it looks like there. Yeah, universality-wise, I'm thoroughly <clears throat> westernized, and most of the places that have a have a notion of the Sabbath would have received from the Christians because Jews, or, or potentially from the Muslims, but because Jews just didn't conquer very much of the world and had very little direct influence over the whole world, and it's certainly thoroughly westernized. I don't know a thing about um, uh, pre-Christianized African cultures or other indigenous cultures. And, uh, you know, so by universal, I don't mean that it actually is universal. What I mean is these verses mean that it is meant to be universal. Right? The verse in, in Genesis clearly says it is meant to be universal. So I want to look at a, one of my favorite stories. It appears in Breshi Rabba. Uh, and I think that the story are, is arguing with a Greek background that sees Shabbat as being something very unnatural. It's a great story, so let's read it. It's on the bottom of page one if you have your sheets. It's Breshi Rabbah, uh, uh, chapter 11, verse five. So I'm just gonna read it in English because the Hebrew gets into Aramaic and it'll be a little hard, but, but it's there. The wicked Turnus Rufus, who is a Roman governor, literally means Turnus is the, another word for tyrant. That right? is sort of a, uh, uh, related to the word tyrant. Rufus is a redhead, so it refers to some redheaded tyrant Roman tyrant. He asked uh, Rabbi Akiva, how does this day differ from other days, meaning Shabbat? The latter replied, how does one man differ from other men? He said to him, what did I say to you and what did you say to me? They evidently don't know what they're saying to each other in the beginning. And Akiva explains it uh, back. You said to me, how does this day differ from other days? Why is the Shabbat day different from all other days? And I said to him, how does one man differ from other men? How is Turnus Rufus different from other men? So Rufus answers him in that the emperor chooses to honor me and not other men. 
Rabbi Akiva answers, so too the king of kings chooses to honor it, meaning the Sabbath. So at, at first, I think the initial answer is, this isn't particularly deep. Right? Why is Shabbat better? Kachazek. God decided that the Shabbat is a more important day. The Shabbat is a day in which you should rest. And just as your choice as emperor or governor is random, you are not physically any different than any other human being, uh, but somehow the emperor chose you to be the governor, so too Shabbat is not physically different from any other day. It's still the same day, but God chose the seventh day. It's not a very satisfactory answer. Uh, I've never been a big fan, and I don't think Rabbi Akiva seems to be a big fan of kachazet. That's just the way it is. God said so. And now Rufus asks him the question that I think is uh, the most pertinent question in this Midrash. How do you know this? How do you know that Shabbat is the day that God chose to sanctify? Uh, it may even be related to, you know, how do we know that we're not eternally celebrating the wrong day of Shabbat? We got the count wrong one day in some kind of proto-history, and really Tuesday is Shabbat, and Jews have been celebrating Shabbat for the wrong day for the rest of history. How do we know that? So Rabbi Akiva answers him. It is proved by the fact that the river Sambat Yon, which flows so swiftly on weekdays that it pulls up stones from its bed, does not pull them up on the Shabbat when it rests. So has anyone ever heard of the Sambat Yon? I taught a shear with your dad there once about the Sambat Yon. He had a lot of comments. He, knew, he seemed to know a lot about the Sambat Yon. So the Sambat Yon is this legendary <laughs> river. It's just coming back to me now when you your dad there, maybe a couple years ago. It's this legendary river that all sorts of fascinating later legends accrue to it. Um, concerning uh, 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 the dead coming to drink from it on Shabbat and the ten lost tribes being on the other side of the Sambat Yom. But originally, it's connected to Shabbat. Uh, you can see that in the word. It almost sounds like Shabbat Yom. The word is almost there. Fascinatingly, this river is originally, and this I mentioned in the Safari sheet, originally mentioned by Pliny the Elder, the Greek historian, who says that there is a river... That, um, that only runs on Shabbat. Right? No, he says that it dries up. Excuse me. There's a confusion. I get, you know, if you have the source sheet, let's go to there. Pliny says that it dries up on Shabbat. There's this river in the land of Judea that dries up on Shabbat, and it's part of a Greek polemic, a Greek and Roman polemic against Shabbat. What they basically say is there's nothing natural about Shabbat. You Jews are going against nature. Human beings were meant to work every day. And when you stop working, you're fighting the forces of nature. You're lazy. Uh, and occasionally they accuse them of being things like superstitious. Why do you believe that day is better, more special than any other day? So some kind of superstition about lucky days, which was part of their culture and probably still part of our culture as well. Uh, and there's a lot of... Um, really anti-Jewish rhetoric focused on Shabbat by the Greeks and Romans. It's always interesting to note, what did the Greeks and Romans know about what Jews did? How well did Greeks and Romans even know eternal acts of, uh, in, internal uh, acts of the Jewish community in their midst? And one thing they rail, they rail about two main things. One is they keep apart. They're not big fans of the Jews' separatism. And another big thing they rail against is Shabbat. You're lazy, you don't like to work. The only reason you do this is you just get <coughs> lazy. Circumcision. Uh, circumcision. circumcision at times, too. And the mm? the uh, not so much the Chazer. Chazer you find in the, in the later, in, in Jewish sources, about, Christian, about, um, about projected onto Greeks and Romans. They eat, eating separately is one thing, but I don't know if they mention specifically the fact that Jews don't eat chazer. They don't. They, they well, don't like it that they sit separately. Mm -hmm. Eating separately. Eating thing. separately is a big thing. Whether they choose to eat this food or not, that appears in a later version of the of the Hanukkah story. But one of the big things is keeping separate and Shabbat, which de facto does keep people separate. If you can't work every Shabbat, then you're separate and you're own, you're you're in with your own communities. So here's Rabbi Akiva. Uh, and it appears in Josephus as well. Josephus sort of reverses the river. This river flows on Shabbat. So everyone's arguing about this river, this legendary Sambat Yon, and Rabbi Akiva comes and says, look, it's part of nature. That seems to be the, same, the major proof of this Midrash. Shabbat is not imposed upon nature, but the natural world 
observes Shabbat as well. Obviously, this is something very hard for us to observe, or we don't know of any Shabbat Yom, Shabbat Yom uh, river. But the argument there is he's trying to push it to be more natural, more universal, as if to say, look, Rufus, you're not observing the laws of nature. Nature says things should stop on Shabbat. This river stops on Shabbat. You, the Greek or uh, uh, Roman emperor, you're not observing the laws of nature. So the conversation goes on and gets deeper into the laws of nature and Shabbat. And Rufus responds, are you trying to lash me? Meaning, are you just trying to whip me with your silly proof? Rabbi Akiva comes back a necromancer. Second time, who where did we talk about necromancers last week? Oh. In my uh, oh, Gata class, <laughs> yeah. I was very happy to hear necromancer again. <laughs> necromancer will be my proof, someone who raises the dead. For he can raise a ghost or a spirit uh, on any weekday, but not on Shabbat. You should check this with your very father. Meaning, go try to raise your dad and see what happens. So Rufus goes off, does a little experiment here. That Rufus went off and made the test with his own father. Every day he raised him, but on the Shabbat he could not raise him. So evidently Rufus' father is down in the netherworld, not doing so well down there as we'll see. Uh, and Rufus is a necromancer. He has the ability to do this, and he brings him up from the dead all week. And on Shabbat, he can't raise him. After the Shabbat, he again raised him and asked him, here's his dad. Have you become a Jew since you died? Which is an ultimate irony, right? Here's Rufus' dad, assumedly an oppressor of Jews while he was alive, and all of a sudden, down in the netherworlds, wherever whatever we call that place he is, he's keeping Shabbat. Why did you rise all the days of the week, but not on Shabbat? The father replied, he who does not observe the Shabbat when he is in your world can do so by his own choice. Uh, and, or as sort of the translation should be, and does so by his own choice, is here compelled to observe it. And in other words, somehow, down in the other world, people have to observe the laws of nature. In the real world, people have, this is the way at least I read this, I gotta, people have freedom to choose whether or not to rest or not. We do not have to observe the laws of nature in this world. But in the other world, where people don't have choices, uh, about how they observe, or that the dead do not have a choice about what kind of lives they live, there he's compelled to observe Shabbat. Evidently, at this point, it means that he can't be raised on Shabbat. Now he goes deeper. Rufus asks, Now what work, what labor are you performing on weekdays such that you need to rest on Shabbat? I mean, you know, you're down in the netherworlds. What are you, what are you doing down there? You don't, need to, you don't need to rest on Shabbat. The father replies, On weekdays we are punished but on Shabbat, we are allowed to rest. There's a, some famous agadot here about uh, it comes into all sorts of crazy play in Jewish, Jewish uh, ritual that on Shabbat, uh, people are not judged. In, it's called hell, if you like, right, to use a Christian word. Right? People are not judged down in hell, and even the, even the dead have a day off from their, from their judgment. In hell. Now, again, I'm not interested in punishment in hell. This is not the topic of, of this particular discussion this morning. What I'm interested in is that, the, again, the laws of nature observe Shabbat. The fires of hell cease burning on Shabbat. And if you consider, I think this Agata would consider them part of the laws of nature, just the way the world works. Rufus came back to Rabbi Akiva and asked him, and here I think is a very important question. If God wishes to honor Shabbat, as you say, let him not cause winds to blow on that day. Let him not cause rain to come down on that day. Let him not cause grass to grow on that day. Meaning, look around you. Okay, maybe you can find the Sambakyon River and my your dead father, but the rest of the world works on Shabbat. The natural world does not cease on Shabbat. Everybody knows this. All you have to do is look around. And Rabbi Akiva responds, Made the, with, at first with, a, I think, a poor response, and then a, a better response at the end. May the breath of such a man be blasted out. I will tell you a parable comparing this to two who live in a courtyard. If this one sets up an Eruv and this one does not set up an Eruv, are they allowed to carry in the courtyard? The answer is no. I don't want to get into the laws of, of Eruvim. a little complicated over here. But if only one dwells in the courtyard, I mean, one person, he may carry in the entire courtyard. So too God, since there is no other power but him, may carry throughout the world. Well, yeah, fair, but it sounds to me just like, kachaze again. Right? Just Rakiva goes back to saying, well, God is God, and God can do whatever God wants. 
not much of an answer, I don't think. But then he comes up with, I think, a little bit of a dig deeper answer, which is going to get us into the second half of the equation. Or moreover, those who ate the manna can testify that it came down all the days of the week, but it did not come down on Shabbat. That is another example of natural phenomenon, of, uh, a natural phenomena observing Shabbat, a story of the manna in um, in, uh, in Shemot. And I'm going to turn, we're going to turn to that in a second. Um, but for now, the argument seems to be that Rabbi Akiva says, look, there is such a thing as a universal Shabbat. It's not just imposed by God, or it's not just directly imposed as a law, artificially created law, but it's woven into the fabric of the universe. The world observes Shabbat, and therefore you Greeks and Romans who don't observe Shabbat, what you're doing doesn't make rational sense by not observing Shabbat. It's an argument I think is difficult for us because Rufus's question sort of resonates with us. Right? The rest of the world is working on Shabbat. There's nothing natural about Shabbat. Astronomy, they may be lurking here too, astronomy doesn't work by Shabbat. The year, the day, the month, the, the sun, the moon, and the stars, and, then, uh, and the earth all obey those laws. But Shabbat, it's just you just made it up. I don't actually think the, um, the error of part of his answer is so shallow and I think mm. it's part of, I think the combination of the two answers um, work really well as a pair okay. um, because I think that like there's a sense in which um, like on Shabbat like everything should totally stop and like it should be totally dissimilar from the weekday but that would be that would be impracticable um, that, that wouldn't that's not really feasible so there's there's like what, what he's saying is, and also the manner answer doesn't account for the fact that grass is growing. Like mm -hmm. Rufus is right that, that there is grass growing. Rufus is right that there is stuff that's happening in the world. So he has to say he has to come up with an answer that's something like, um, like there are there are systems and mechanisms by which we can set stuff in motion before Shabbat mm -hmm. um, in order that like to make Shabbat more feasible. And how do we do that? We build arrows, we have Shabbat cookers, and those sorts of things. So that we can, so that Shabbat's not totally unfeasible, and that like Shabbat can be good. But those things have to be set in motion before before Shabbat and prepared for before Shabbat, and that's what the error is. But then, on the other hand, there are things that are like manifestly different. And that's good argument. I, I think he's kind of saying that God is. I mean, I think that the Eruv. It's interesting to think about. There are ways of uh, working on Shabbat or accomplishing the things we need to say. But in this particular one, he seems to emphasize emphasize that God can do whatever God wants because God is the sole power. And words, within the Eruv, he's not arguing that the Eruv allows us to break the laws of nature. What he's saying, at least more directly, is God is the sole authority in the world, and that all of the world is God's courtyard, and therefore God can choose to do whatever God wants. I mean, at least that seems to be the more direct argument. But I do think that, look, let's face it, the universal Shabbat, it's even admitted tacitly sort of in the, in the, in the Midrash, is unrealistic. Okay, we can find the mana, and we can find the raising of the dead, and we can find uh, this weird river. But all other rivers flow on Shabbat. The grass grows, the wind blows, everything flow, goes on Shabbat. So it, it, it's a little hard to just wave all that away. If Shabbat is universal in, and woven into the fabric of the universe, it's not, not so much. It's hard to find. It's, it's, you have to find historical examples. And it, it doesn't really work all that well. It's not, I don't think we perceive of it as a particularly strong argument. I think most of our senses would be, if, if Shabbat is universal, it's more in the human sense. Humans need rest. Humans thrive. And, 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 and we're not created to be like animals, right? I'm reading, um, reading a book on Adam and Eve now, where he talks, in the end of the book, it's a great book, um, in the end of the book he talks about chimpanzees as if they were living before the fall. Chimpanzees are living. What would our lives have looked like before Adam and Eve? They look like chimpanzees now. Now, I don't know that much about chimpanzees, but I would imagine that their behavior is relatively standard every single day of the week. And that whatever they're doing, hunting, uh, <laughs> mating, picking lice off of each other's back to get to your lice, uh, so you know, over there, they don't really take a day off from doing that. I don't think that any other animals do. And there's something unnatural um, about it. And to even argue that human beings naturally take a day off is virtually impossible in his world. In our world, it's, it's intuitive. But in their world, it wasn't intuitive. 
human beings just did not take days off. So it's a very hard argument. And <laughs> I think the, the air analogy makes sense to me in this way. Um, if you were to take a spirit from the netherworld and put it into this world, or if you should take, say, mana from another world mm -hmm. and put it into this world, or the sama chon from when it warns, ever it flows right. to this world, that seems to be a different domain carrying than rain from one uh, aspect of, uh, from above the rakia to below, from the grass from below the ground to above the ground, and from the wind from one part of the sky to another. What it means to say is that um, Shabbat uh, has puts limits not on the natural world, but on the on the on the crossover between the supernatural and the natural world. And uh, he means to say, uh, so you can you say that nature itself doesn't rest, but nature is within the reshut of of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a single reshut. But there are reshuts that make things impossible that are suddenly you're unable to cross from one part to the other. Uh, so the big problem with you Romans and Greeks is that you don't consider that, uh, that okay, you, you so much focus on the natural world, the natural body, the natural everything, and totally neglect the aspect of reality that you already know of, that you already practice with, that somehow that, that is actually has a great amount of relevance in the in the daily Jewish life and week. This may be just a little too self-evident, but it may, it perhaps it is worth um, stating. Um, in the, the animal analogy, I don't think it's necessarily just that humans have the faculties that are above that of most other animals, uh, but civilization. I mean, in order to even get to this point, you have to have writing, you have to have a certain capacity to store food, I would wager that certain uncontacted tribes in the Amazon basin don't, even, even, even though that they have faculties that are beyond those of animals, they couldn't do a day of rest. It's beyond their, they, they have to do like, you know, every day we will, we must every day go and hunt or we will die. Um, I think what you're pointing out, Shabbat is far removed from our chimpanzee origins, right? I mean, and you common know, like, ancestral origins, if you will. Right? Up, Shabbat up presumes a high level, level of quite high. Yeah. Sure. Wait, one more, and then we're gonna move on. Um, also, just you know, aside from just the abstract arguments, just like a much simpler level, it says in creation that God gives the plants the autonomy to just keep growing by themselves. That's Roa Zera, right? Like that they're just gonna keep creating their own species and right. gives them that autonomy. In the same I mean, way that he say that in Reishi, but I guess you can read it in there, yeah. You know? it, it does say that. But they're gonna keep producing according to their species and their kind. Okay. Go ahead, and, yeah. And right. so will the fish and everything else. So right. just at a, at a much more basic level, could that just be the argument of the reason why God doesn't stop nature is because God already gave nature the autonomy to run by itself and it's going back to the Jonathan Sachs thing of this is our independence from nature as in nature doesn't always, d doesn't depend on us, it's going to keep running anyway. Okay, but Rabbi Akiva sees Shabbat in nature, let's not deny, there's the Sambat Yon that stops every sh every Shabbat. I think that he sees that as evidence that Shabbat is, the ceasing is part of nature. Uh, the dead can't be raised, the dead aren't um, judged on Shabbat. In other words, clearly everybody understands that there are processes that continue on their own through Shabbat. But there is something natural about you. Right, I want to move on to the next, the, the next story. The next story is the, the familiar one about the mana. I'm not going to read all of it. But the mana, I think, is going to bring us sort of to the, the cusp, the borderline between particularity and universality. Right? On the one hand, let's think about the mana, right? The story goes, right, you know, you're familiar with the story. Uh, the mana isn't going to come down on the seventh day, and therefore on the sixth day they have to collect it twice. So there's something, again, something natural about Shabbat being woven, if you will, into natural phenomena in the universe. Uh, and we think of the mana as quite miraculous, but it's remarkable how the, the children of Israel are like, oh, okay, great, mana is going to fall from the sky. They don't, they don't seem to think it's particularly miraculous. Particularly miraculous. What don't they believe will happen? Some of them, at least. What don't they believe will happen? 
Well, they don't believe in the double portion. They have trouble believing that two will fall. And then the next day, they don't believe they, they don't believe two things. One is they don't believe that it won't last to the next day. So some of them leave it over the next day. But they don't believe that, um, that it won't fall on Shabbat. They go out and try to collect it again on Shabbat. In other words, it, it's, it's, it's interesting what they believe and what they don't believe. They anticipate that mana is a natural phenomenon. If it's going to start well, coming from the sky, it's going to start coming from the sky, great. But that it should observe the ways of the world in which things either come all seven days of the week or they don't just stop on the seventh day because you say they're going to stop. Um, and, and Moses gets very angry at them. Um, so on the one hand, I think there's something very, again, universal about it. Moses, Ki'ilu, is showing... Either if you want, God is control, has control over nature, and natural phenomena will obey, obey God's vision for the world of Shabbat. Uh, or you could say, in a more, even a more natural sense, that there are phenomena, natural phenomena, the mana being one of them, that fall on Shabbat, fall on the rest of the week, and just don't fall on Shabbat. And they observe the natural world. Now, the particularity of it is that this doesn't come for all of the world. I don't know if there's mana for other people wandering around in the wilderness. We don't know that. But it comes in a part of the Torah that is very particular. Uh, it's the Jewish experience. The Jews, the Israelites have left Egypt. Uh, it's not given to the rest of the world. Um, and it sounds like it's moving more towards the particular. And I would characterize this as something that's natural, perhaps universal, but can only be experienced by those who keep the Sabbath. Somewhere sort of in between. And it ties in, at least in an ideological sense to me, another one of my favorite stories, this one you're probably familiar with, with Rebbe and Antoninus, another Roman emperor. It's probably not accidental that we're constantly discussing Shabbat with Roman emperors because they don't have Shabbat. So this is there in some children's stories. I used to read this with my kids. Uh, Rebbe made a feast for Antoninus on Shabbat. They brought before him prepared foods that were cold. He ate them and found them very tasty. He, Rebbe, made a feast for him, for Antoninus, on a weekday and brought before him steaming foods. He, Antoninus, said to Rebbe, those, the cold food on Shabbat, tasted better to me than the warm food. It's unnatural. He, Rebbe, explained that the warm weekday food was missing a single spice. He, Antoninus, said to him, and is there anything in the king's treasury that is lacking? He, Rebbe, said that the food that was missing Shabbat. Do you have Shabbat? Okay. Um, basically, Rebbe has Shabbat, and Antoninus does not have Shabbat. And food tastes better on Shabbat, even if it's cold, than warm food tastes during the week. It's this magical spice of Shabbat. It's, have you seen the kid's story? There's a woman who teaches uh, at, at, at uh, RRC, Ma Mira, Myra, what's her name? Mira Wasserman. Mira. She wrote a children's book on it. She studied here a long time ago. It's a very cute children's book. Um, and book she the teaches there too, right? She does. She just published a book on the Tractate of Ozara too. Right, right. But, well, her first public, I don't know if it was her first public, her pri uh, one of her she prior publications was an adorable <laughs> children's book. You can write to her, tell her I quoted on that. It's very important to me. Now, again, you can ask the question, is, is Shabbat natural? So the natural phenomenon of cooked food seem to observe the laws of Shabbat. So there is something, I think, natural, uh, scientific, if you will, about Shabbat. But on the other hand, who can taste it? Mm -hmm. Only those, it sounds like only those who can keep, who keep Shabbat. He, Rebbe responds to them, Yesh lecha Shabbat, do you have Shabbat? You can't make your food taste this way, even if you were to sort of keep cook it on Shabbat, because you don't have Shabbat. You don't really observe Shabbat. It's this natural phenomenon that is, let's say, accessible to all human beings, but if you don't observe Shabbat, which I think is what he's saying to Antoninus, you can't taste that spice. You won't know what it tastes like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's something confusing with the translation. I want to go over it again. Right? Um, yeah, Antoninus can taste the food that Rebbe made for Shabbat. 
Right. So Antoninus, but Antoninus, I want to look it up again. It might be that I only quoted part of it. I, there's a lot of sources here. I believe that part of the uh, got uh, Antoninus goes and tries to make the same food with the same ingredients. I can't yeah. do it. Uh, so I want to look it up in the quote. The quote might have gotten this. Placed in some kind of moving from. But he from, can taste the Shabbat. He can taste Shabbat right, so when Jews cook the food, when Rebbe cooks the food. The food. Yeah. So there is some accessibility and some naturality to it, but when Antoninus tries to cook his own food, he can't. Yeah, it's the difference between being able to taste a dish someone else prepared because they have the right spices and right. not being able to prepare because you just lack that in your cabinet. Before. Right, he lacks Shabbat to be a hole in his cabinet. In his cabinet of spices, he can't make the food taste that good because he doesn't observe Shabbat. Now, you could argue here it's accessible to him. Were he to start keeping Shabbat, perhaps he would be able to taste that food. And it's unclear to me if he were to, certainly if he were to convert, but what if he were to start keeping Shabbat as a non-Jew? Would he then be able to taste it? Would he taste it um, if it was cooked before Shabbat? Would it taste better? Which is part of the paradox with cooking on Shabbat is really... We all know that food does not necessarily get better when it's re reheated the next day. Um, to put it mildly, it often does not get better. But uh, the, the, what I'm trying to get at here is this sort of borderline between the universality and the particularity of Shabbat. Yeah, um, I'm kind of tracking in both of these British Sheet Rabbah stories what yeah. seems to be the most compelling <clears throat> lesson about Shabbat, and right. in both cases it seems to me at least that the most compelling thing that changes these, these two emperors' minds is not natural world, is not like a proof from a rabbi, mm -hmm. but is actually like what they learn from their own experience, which kind of, in the sense of the, the, the dead father tells the, the kid. But it's naturally observed from experience, in other words, it's experience that they feel in the natural world. It's not a think, philosophical discussion yes. where somebody says to them, it makes sense to keep Shabbat. I think that somewhere between particularism and universality is our own experiences, that we broke okay. through kind of both, the meaning of both, is what I'm saying. Okay, I would interpret universalism. I mean, I'm not like maybe I, there's maybe more than one way to use the word universalism, but universalism would be an experience that's accessible to anybody in the world, and also makes sense for anybody in the world to to. Uh, I mean, once we dec decide that a certain bacteria is harmful or helpful to you, it's generally speaking. I mean, maybe there's some exceptions. Generally speaking, universal. Uh, none of us want malaria. It's universal, and uh, and all of us want uh, healthy types of, of of bacteria. We wouldn't argue that one, you know, well, I experience it this way. If the taste of Shabbat is good, if the rules of Shabbat, if the, the dead observe Shabbat, you can hear it in his father's words. You didn't keep Shabbat in that world. Now you're forced to keep it in this world, which, by the way, is going to directly contradict the source we're going to see soon. This idea that everybody should be keeping Shabbat. You might ask, why is Turnus Rufus, his father, being punished for not keeping Shabbat? Okay, now, it doesn't exactly say he's being punished, but you kind of get a hint. Why should he keep Shabbat? He's not Jewish. Shabbat is something particular. And we're going to see texts that move in that direction. Four more I read both of these sources, you know, these sources. Um, the second one, the first one, really, but the, set, the second one, because it feels like it's Shabbat is an experience that's condi that anyone has access to if they yeah. if they're only to keep. It sounds like that. Yeah. Yeah, you should taste the Shabbat. Uh, yeah. Salt is probably liking some degree of salt is probably universal. If you don't have salt, your dishes don't taste as good. If you don't have Shabbat, your dishes don't taste as good. So yo, Antoninus, either convert and start keeping Shabbat, or just start keeping Shabbat, and your food will taste better. All right, the particular verses begin quite blatantly later on in the, in the book of Shemot. The verse, the quote you know, but V'shamu uh, b'nei Yisrael ha-shabat v'asod ha-shabat v'edor otam b'rit olam. Now, the word there, b'rit olam, is a little confusing, and we'll see some word play with that, but the pshat of b'rit olam is eternal. It's not b'rit le-olam, meaning a world covenant. It's part of the eternal covenant between God and God. And Israel. I think that that's clearly the shot of the word there. Beni uh, uvein b'nei Yisrael oti le'olam. Again, le'olam there is not an oath for the world, but an eternal sign of the particular covenant. This you might call, as opposed to the particular shot, you might call it a covenantal 
version of Shabbat, where Shabbat becomes a covenant between God and Israel. And it's, I think, as particular as you can possibly get. Very much something that is there for B'nai Yisrael and not for Umot not for the rest of the world. Uh, it doesn't really make sense for anybody else in the world to be keeping signs of the covenant between Israel and God. That's a particular covenant, the same way we might think of other particular mitzvot as being signs of observing the brit between God and the people of Israel. So too Shabbat is not something that's natural. It's a law that reflects the natural, reflects creation. But it is the observance in this world of Shabbat is part of the covenant between people of Israel and, and God. And it's picked up um, very clearly in a few Midrashim. So the simplest one is in Mechel to Rabbi Yishmael. Be'ni uvein b'nei Yisrael v'ro be'ni uvein amot ha'olam. Or be'ni umot, the Rashi Tevot is of day... Uh, Elilim. Elilim, right, the word is just skipping, right, worshippers of idols. Right, God, the, the, the Shabbat is a sign between me and Israel, and it is not a sign between me, God, and the rest of the world. Uh, the same kind of uh, concept appears in, uh, in Bavli and Beitza, in Masech and Beitza. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Mishim Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Kol mitzvot shem tan lehem akadosh baruch hu Yisrael, natan lehem b'far hesia. God gave all of the mitzvot to Israel in public. Why did God give them to Israel in public? So that the rest of the world could hear them and and learn them. And if they decide not to observe them, then that's sort of their own decision. There's nothing hidden about it. The only one that's hidden is Chutz Mi Shabbat. Very interesting. The only mitzvah that God hid from the rest of the world and didn't let the rest of the world know about it even, Shanatan Lehem Betzina, was given in private, Shanamar Beni Uvein Bnei Yisrael Oti Leomah. Uh, Shabbat is highly, and this Midrash is the most particular of mitzvot. It is not incumbent upon the rest of the world. It is hidden from the rest of the world, almost as a sense that God did not want the rest of the world to observe Shabbat. God only wanted B'nai Israel to observe Shabbat. How does that make sense of Tisha Well, how do you make sense? I don't know. I, yes. I think that I think that's like an attention. Like, why, why would you want to ground something particular in creation? It's a tension in the verse itself. I think it's a, it's a strong tension in the verse. Um, and I think I'd like to come at the end to some kind of experiential resolution of how we experience Shabbat. On an ideological level, it seems even more difficult. I think in an experiential level, I can understand it. On an ideological element, why would rabbis imagine that God doesn't want the rest of the world to keep Shabbat is harder for me to imagine. But also what's about the creation. Mm -hmm. but also what's well, that's there in the Torah. You can't deny it's there from the first verses of the Torah, and it's mentioned in virtually every other circumstance in which we talk about Shabbat. So that is... Um, I mean, I, we could get into a whole issue of covenantal theology and God's relationship with the rest of the world. I don't want to go so far afield. When, when, do, you, when do you start having Christian polemics against uh, changing from... Yeah, so I don't think that that's at this period yet. Right? No. Right? There were, look, by the Mechilta to Rebbe Yishmael, Christianity was probably a tiny blip on their radar. radar. Um, but there's another more complicated issue. When did Christians move... Shabbat to Sunday is not so, so, so there are, um, I have a whole book I found called From the Lord, from Sabbath Day to the Lord's Day. It's like a 400 page book and I will have to admit I did not have time to read the whole book going through basically Christian observance of the Sabbath throughout all of history. It's a series of essays. Um, Christians had a lot, and we'll talk about that later, a little bit later on, but they had a lot of uh, discussions. First of all, whether Sabbath was incumbent upon them at all. It's part of the mitzvot. You don't see Paul saying that uh, you have to keep the Sabbath. Uh, and in their, and I'm talking about Gentile Christians, I'm not talking about Jewish Christians, I'm talking about they're turning to the Gentiles, and I'm also speaking about Christians who did not believe, those who did not believe that most of the mitzvot were incumbent. Upon Jew, upon uh, Gentiles, such as circumcision, for the most part, I think most of them 
thought that the Sabbath was also not incumbent upon them. Um, the move towards Sunday happened gradually, um, but I don't think you have to go that far for Rabbi Yochanan to say that it's a, an anti-Christian thing. I think that he is increasingly, perhaps based on his own perceptions, looking around the world and saying, look, adultery, thievery, murder, most of the other big commandments um, are, are observed by all, all people. Whether the Midrash says they don't or they don't, they do or they don't, we know the Romans have laws, the Greeks have laws. They observe these kinds of, of commandments. We know there are things that are highly particular, such as the particular sacrifices, the red heifer, the eating customs. Those seem to strike us as more particular. Uh, even if you look at the laws of Kashrut, uh, the, um, uh, the laws of Kashrut are not, they don't even seem from the Torah to be incumbent upon all of humanity. And we can maybe do another shear on that. Shabbat's kind of lies somewhere in between. Uh, and it's moving here, I think, in the rabbinic period towards the, the particular. Uh, that this is something simply experienced only by Jews. And I want to skip the, the Amek Devar is a, a much later commentary on this major. I want to skip it for the time being. And um, move to one more quote, then we're going to move a little bit to some of the normative Mishnaya that hopefully some of you are learning. Um, there's a very famous quote in Sanhedrin in the Sugya about the Bnei Noach. Uh, uh, Reish Lakish says, Oved kochavim, a goy sheshavat chayav mita. A goy, a non-Jew who, who stops working, similarly here on Shabbat, is obligated for the death penalty. Now, the death penalty, they, the rabbis tend to bandy it around at times, throwing the death penalty for this and that. I don't think he literally means that you should go out and kill non-Jews who stop working for one day, but it's a strong statement of non-Jews are not supposed to stop working. Shabbat was solely given to the Jews. It wasn't given to anyone else in the world, so much so that non-Jews are not allowed to observe it. And it's interesting, the, the quote that he brings is, which the pshat is, day and night shall not cease. In the cycles of the day, it's a natural phenomenon. From now on, right, this is given after the flood, God will not interrupt the flow of nature. But Rabbi Rachel Kish reads it, not that the sun and the day and the moon, or the day and the night won't cease, but non-Jews will not cease working, as if it's addressed to non-Jews. <laughs> they shall never rest. In other words, I think what you have here, what any sense anyone want to try a stab at what Rachel Kish is doing here? How is he understanding Shabbat in the world or non-Jews in the world? Any thoughts? I'm not, uh, you heard you said a few times not working, um, but I, I, see, I mean the, the the verb is to to like to Shabbat. Okay, so which means essentially, I, uh, my first guess would be to say that there are at this point very certain Shabbat things to do, and if non non Jews do them, that's a problem. Not necessarily that they can't stop working. Such as what? Um, I, I'm saying kiddush. I don't know, like, like kiddush. Going to Musaf. No. Yeah, exactly right. right. Um, I could be. I think that Yishpotu here probably is more, like, more easily, lo Yishpotu is they shall not uh, cease. Right? Or they shall not not cease. Right? Uh, and probably the simplest interpretation of Shabbat is lo tasem But maybe we'll get a little bit into some of the particulars. Um, I think probably the pshat is ovid kochavim Shabbat means cease working. Um, it's harder, I think, to read in did Kiddush. No, it. but like, is there a way to, at this point to cease working Jewishly? As Support it as if they're a Jew. That might be getting to like what, like I think some scholars, Mordechai is trying to hint at, that this is a polemic against Christianity. Oh, I guess Potential. I, I don't, there's hmm? Ignatius and Justin are railing against those who are observing Christians. Who are observing against the Jews. Violence. Against some Jews, that's, that's right? Something. Oh, that's Justin, the quote from Justin, later Justin, on? Justin. Yeah, so no, it's hard to. This is already. This is second. Yeah, I just don't know if rabbis are. This is second century, um, end of the first century. Yeah, I don't know if rabbis are yet really against Christians for keeping. No, Shabbat. I'm just saying I don't know what the other. Yeah. Like Justin Martyr was in uh, second right? century. Yeah, second century, and he lived there. He lived close. He lived right, and he lived there and and so. So they they might have. Moved. 
Quite a bit of contact. And therefore, Rabbi should be saying what about non -Jew, about Christians keeping Shabbat? I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not sen sensing much of a, uh, of, a, of, a of an anti-Christian argument over here, but I think what he's trying to say is he's, he's putting them into nature. Josh, I don't know. Was there, you was say that? I mean, basically, there's. I don't want to get into. We learned this all last year. Um, the, more probably than this source says anything about Jew about the Shabbat, it says something about Jews, 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 or at least Rachel Keish's view of non-Jews. The non-Jews are a form of nature over here. I think that you know it's not uh, something I find appealing, but there's a little bit of a loss of humanity here. Uh, that non-Jews are put into the category of like sun and earth and sky and animals, right? Which continue to well, do what they do. They don't take a day off. Now they have to take a day off, or your animal has to take a day off. That's um, the, the putting of non-Jews in the scheme of nature. You yeah. have in a lot of places. Like there are a lot of midrashim, like the beginning of Sefer and There's a whole yeah. midrash that. that that lays out, or all yeah. the that in the end, you know, it's Shemaim, Aretz, nature, and non-Jews. Yeah. And that they're ruled by the stars and right. Jews aren't. That's right, and Jews aren't. Um, but it's certainly, at least uh, as a de facto, moving Shabbat completely into the Jewish realm. Right. One more comment? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's uh, an idea that the Sabbath is holy, mm -hmm. it's also there's an idea that the Jewish people are holy. Mm -hmm. What happens when you bring something that's Tame into something that's Kadosh? That's that's where a lot of the Chayav Mita stuff comes from. So it's what it's saying is, um, it's not that non-Jews shouldn't observe Shabbat, it's that they can't observe Shabbat because Shabbat is, in the same way you can't approach a holy space unless there's uh, at least purity on your part, you can't approach a holy time without a certain purity on your part. Okay, I think uh, let's leave aside the purity thing there, but the, the idea of kedusha may be working in the background here and there. I think that there's something, the word is called Aveya Kadeshehu, right? God sanctifies Shabbat. Sanctifying it, bringing into the realm of, perhaps according to these texts, Israelite realm, which God does sanctify B'nai Israel according to <coughs> many texts. Uh, and therefore, the Am Kadosh belongs to the Yom Kadosh, and anybody else does not belong here. I don't want to go into the, the issue of Tameh entering into the Kedusha, sure, yeah. but there may be something working in there, the connection to the Kedusha of Shabbat and the connection to the Kedusha of, of, uh, of B'nai Israel. But he doesn't quote that text. He quotes the texts that go back to the natural phenomenon, and as opposed to, let's say, Shabbatizing, if that's a word, the nature, it's saying nature observes Shabbat, it goes the other way around. It says non-Jews are not, uh, in this context, considered anything but part of nature. Nature doesn't observe Shabbat. So too non-Jews do not have to observe Shabbat and should not observe Shabbat. Now, I want to move to a few Mishnah out here. Um, some of this material is my stuff that you may have learned. Um, there may be, right, let's, let's face it, in reality, experience reality, Jews do not have the ability to get non-Jews to keep Shabbat. They can say it all they want, rabbis can say it all they want, but Greeks and Romans weren't going to listen to them. That's just a, a function of reality. So in their push for universalism, if they believed in a universal Shabbat, rabbis' means are going to be limited, as they are with most things. Right? Rabbis did not have the political power, nor did they really seem to have a particular drive to go out and convert and get the rest of the world to observe their understanding of mitzvot. Um, but you may hear... Uh, I think an echo of this in a few texts that talk about Jewish relations with non-Jews on Shabbat. Um, and here I admit that there's more than one way to interpret some of these debates, but the first section is that famous debate that you've been learning in Mishnah, I think if you learned the first paragraph of Shabbat, um, between the, the debates between Beit Shammah and Beit Hillel about setting a motion and process involving a non-Jew before Shabbat. So Beit Shammai says one should not sell something to a non-Jew on Friday or help him load an animal or lift a burden onto himself, onto the non-Jew, unless there is sufficient time for him to reach a neighboring place before Shabbat, but Beit Hillel permits it. Uh, it may be, you could ask the question about Beit Shammai. Why should Beit Shammai, if I sell something to a non-Jew, Erev Shabbat, why? What's the problem with that? So he's going to carry it home. We know that the non-Jews don't keep Shabbat. 
We know that they're carrying their own stuff. They're engaging in commerce. They do whatever they want to do on Shabbat. What particular problem should there be if I sell something that is no longer mine, it belongs to him? So what should I care about selling something to a non-Jew Arab Shabbat? Have you were in this Mishnah? Some of you were in this Mishnah. Yeah? What did, any answers? What did you come up with? Anyone come up with anything? Yeah. We, we talked about the idea of your things as being an extension of you. And yeah. Like even if you're selling something, it, there's sort of like still some you on it for a while. Yeah, some you. You, you don't rub, rub off of it. You, you're on it. If you know, like it looks like the Bavli goes a little bit in that direction. It says something like everybody. The Torah already says, right? You're not allowed to have stranger. Your stranger. Your gercha do work for your animal. Um, and if you were to, like, say, give your plow to a non-Jew, Erev Shabbat, and loan it to him, for instance, people, this is what the Bavli says, people might think that the non-Jew who's plowing on Shabbat is doing your plowing, in which case, which you're clearly not allowed to tell a non-Jew to plow your field on Shabbat. That is definitely prohibited according to the Mishnah. So the Bavli goes a little bit in that direction and kind of says, well, it'll look like that. Um, it's still like people don't know yet not to identify it with you. The problem is, if it's his burden, ain't to he's got his donkey there. It's his stuff on his donkey. It seems a little like a stretch to say people are going to think that it's your stuff. Uh, again, the Bavli says something on that direction. But this is his stuff. You're helping him load up his donkey. It's like a nice thing to do, Adorama, Arab Shabbat. But you can't do that unless you know that he's going to be able to get home, which I want to argue over here is a little bit of a remnant. Right? The rabbis live in a world, we live in a world, where we're not going to force people to keep Shabbat. It's unrealistic, and it's just not going to happen. But at the least you can do is not, at least according to Beit Shammai, a bet, something that you know, mea achuz, 100%, will be a Shabbat transgression. Loading a donkey with him when he's, I don't know, a few miles away from home, knowing that he's going to be taking it home, and knowing he's going to be carrying it on Shabbat, is one little step that you can do so that you're not directly abetting Shabbat transgression by a non-Jew. The same thing appears in Avodah Zarah about selling animals to non-Jews. You're not allowed to sell Jews, according to Avodah Zarah, are not allowed to sell large animals to non-Jews. Some Jews can sell small animals, some Jews don't, but no one is supposed to sell a large animal to a non-Jew, a cow or an ox. Why not? Because you know that the non-Jew is going to work the animal on Shabbat. That's just what they do. Now... You know, the Bavli says it's a gzera, lest you come and people are going to think you own it, and they're going to think you're, they're working your animal. But it may be like the least we can do, according to that Mishnah and Beit Shammai, is not directly abet non-Jewish work on Shabbat. Matt, you I was just thinking about the, like, the line, Yerecha, Sherebi, Sherecha. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if this would be an extension of that. Like, they're not, they're not staying by you, but you're in the same location. And yeah. yeah. I think that if you read the Torah, you could see a similar kind of argument. You can't, according to the, 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 the Sukkim that appear in the, in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the Ten Commandments, you can't control the rest of the world. You don't have, the Torah does not give you a mandate to go out and make sure nobody else works. But you're not allowed to work anything that's in your direct control. The gercha probably, I think the pshat is, somebody who's working on your land and is subject to your laws. Um, it's not any old, any person in the world. It's somebody who's under your political authority. You can't, he can't work either, even though he's not, let's say, the Torah's terms, a naturalized kind of citizen. He's not an Israel. The same thing with your animals. That you're not allowed to work. Your animals have to have a Shabbat as well. Uh, that's something we tend to forget about, but it, the Torah says it directly. And that may be an echo over here, I think, of Beit Shammai as well. Any time that you have control over some kind of situation, you have to prevent Shabbat, worship, uh, Shabbat and trans transgressions. Does that mean that the Torah would imagine, let's say the Jews were to go out and conquer large lands, that they would have to not make non-Jews work there either? I don't know. That's a harder one to tell. It's, it's, hard, it's hard to tell. Some of that's connected to the status of the gear. But there's some semi-universality, both in that, in that verse and maybe in Beit Shammai. Of course, Beit Hillel permits. 
Beit Hillel says no problem. So we're only talking about Beit Shemai. Um, I mean, I, I it, one can see how it might be convincing to say, well, you know, you're a little part of ensuring that the that the Gentile doesn't, you know, do something that's forbidden, but it's not forbidden to him. Right. Um, I, I've experienced something like, I mean, I think we, if, you, if you're around Gentiles, you may experience something like this in the business world. They may not be aware of Shabbat, and this may, to me, looks like a homer maybe of like, oh, we will cease our business activities much earlier so that they don't, you sell him something, and he says, you know what? I need to come back and buy something from this Jew again. I mean, it, it's it's it, to me, it looks like they're attempting to, to cease their business activities with Gentiles way before the possibility where it becomes a problem for them to have to deal with it. Uh -huh. If you have a guy who shows up at your shop, but close to Shabbat, and says, "I need to buy something," right? How are you going to explain to him? I can't be selling you anything. Rather, if they knew four hours ago. I, the Jews have stopped uh, selling or stopped helping with any type of business activities. That seems to be a plausible explanation as well. They're trying to stop it early enough so as not to offend uh, well, to avoid the, the to avoid the problem. Of, uh -huh. you know. I mean, but according to the shot of the mission, you're walking along, you see a non-Jew, and he says, hey, buddy, come over and help me. And it's like you're going 15 minutes before Shabbat. All right. In other words, some of these are business situations. Some of them lifting the burden. It would be uncomfortable, admittedly, right? But you'd have to say, at least according to this Mishnah, according to Beit Shammai, you'd have to say, sorry, I can't do that. Or hide your well, I mean, I'm not saying it's practical, the, but at least on a theoretical If you're point. on your way home, yeah. and you're on the way, yeah. and he's no longer in the market, it, it's more plausible. I would think that he's within walking distance of home at that point. At the market, if you are helping him with yeah. it, he probably still has several kilometers to go. I mean, this is... Okay, maybe, at least on an ideological basis, though, it seems to be keeping Jews away from non-Jews where they're going to be directly abetting, abetting work. Uh, I want to get into some of these more. The, when the term Goy Shal Shabbat comes to you, or Shabbos Goy, you're probably more familiar with the type of stuff that comes up in the next couple of Mishnah, which have been addressed at length, and I'm not going to go into all of these things. The general... Um, well, I want to read the first Mishnah, which comes up in chapter Tet Zion. Where's Beth? Beth here. She's been learning these? No, she's not here. Oh, well. She missed her opportunity. This is the, uh, the parish she's been learning. I don't know if she got to it yet. Um, a Gentile comes to extinguish the fire. One may not say to him, extinguish or do not extinguish, because it is not their, meaning the Jews' responsibility, to ensure his Sabbat rest. Meaning we have nothing to do with it. We have no responsibility. Their rest is not upon us. They may rest or they may not rest. You can't say them extinguish. You can't say them do not extinguish. You have zero responsibility for them. It doesn't quite so far as to say, like the other source, that they, they shouldn't rest on Shabbat, but it completely separates um, the Jewish responsibility of getting Jews to rest on Shabbat for a child. The next line is, you're supposed to tell them not to put out the fire because shvita to alehen, his rest, the child's rest, is your responsibility. But we have no responsibility for non-Jews on Shabbat. Uh, other Mishnah, even a couple away, get into more, a couple of Mishnah later, I'm going to have to read the whole Mishnah, basically get into passive uh, 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 use of non-Jewish labor, if as long as the non-Jews were not working for Jews, since we have no responsibility for them, we can at times make some uh, use of their labor, uh, but we can't tell them what to do. Why can't we tell them what to do? Why can't we tell them put out the fire or, or, uh, or give my cattle to drink or, uh, or turn the light on for me? Why would we not be able to do this? This is... Why not? If Jews are not responsible for non-Jewish tra Shabbat transgressions, why not just tell Jew non-Jews to work for us on Shabbat? Such as they do in the synagogues I've been to. What's, what's wrong with that if we're not responsible for them? Any thoughts? Why not? Why, why not? It's you know, their choice. Yeah. Well, it's not their choice if, if we're asking them to do it. They like to say, oh, 
I mean, they're not forcing. This isn't like slave labor. But that's just. But it's, it's, uh, it's really you doing the work. Right. I think they're that's just, probably. They become like a button that you can yeah. press. I think that that's probably more. Like, what's the big difference if you tell your finger push the button, or you <laughs> tell your arm to, to put out the fire versus you tell somebody else? You are directly causing that work to be done. That much. You can't do because it's not really all that different than doing it yourself versus instructing somebody to do to do the work for you. Uh, now, even that gets erased under the cases of necessity. I want to look at the last sort of source I want to read um, because I want to, we're going to run out of time. I want to I talk all day. Um, it's from Devarim Rabbah, a late source, but it quotes and brings together a Mishnah from the 24th chapter, the last chapter of Shabbat, and a few other sources, including a different version of racial Lakish. So let's look at that last source. It's on page 5. The halacha is, a Jew who was walking on the way Erev Shabbat and it grew dark, and he had in his coins, and coins, or something else, what should he do? Right? He can't carry those coins anymore. It's a prohibition of carrying. Coins are muksa. It's Erev Shabbat, but he doesn't want to lose the coins. This is what our sages taught. It shouldn't be a question mark there. One for whom the path grows dark, Arab Shabbat, he should give his wallet to a non-Jew. That's a direct quote from the mission. Uh, and that is a direct uh, use of non-Jewish labor on Shabbat. That is not sort of benefiting indirectly from non-Jewish work. Or if it is, it's very, very small, let's say, way of construing it that way. It's, um, it's directly telling a non-Jew, do this work for me, on Shabbat. It seems almost to contradict the Mishnah in chapter <clears throat> Tet Zion, and I do think that there are contradictory Mishnayot about non-Jewish labor within Masechet Shabbat. Uh, it is oftentimes Masechet of Mishnah are not uniform on certain ideas. Uh, they weren't written by one author, it was comp compiled by, by perhaps authors over several generations. And you do, from time to time, find Mishnah that contradict each other. And it seems uh, that this Mishnah somewhat contradicts some of those other Mishnah. Now, it doesn't say you can just carte blanche use non-Jewish labor whenever you want on Shabbat. Right? The situation is one where you're faced with either the Jew loses the coins, or the Jew uses a non-Jew to carry the coins. Uh, and under those circumstances of a certain, what seems to be a certain loss, you're allowed to use non-Jewish labor. But the, the Mishnah doesn't seem to really take it under, it's not such terrible concern. Um, it's, uh, it's taken rel relatively lightly. And Devarim Rabbah combines this with something like our sources that we saw before. And why is it permitted to give it to a non-Jew? Rabbi Levi said, when the children of Noah were commanded, when Noah were commanded, they were commanded only about seven things. And Shabbat was not one of them. It is true, Shabbat does not appear on the Noahide commandment list. And therefore, they are allowed to be given to a non-Jew. Non-Jews can do work on Shabbat. They're not commanded. It is not one of the things that we expect from non-Jews. And Rabbi Yossi Bar Hanina said, a non-Jew who keeps Shabbat before he accepts upon himself circumcision is obligated for the death penalty. It's another version of that Reish Lakish quote. It's forbidden for non-Jews to keep Shabbat. Why? For they were not commanded to keep this. And why did you say that a non-Jew who keeps Shabbat is liable for the death penalty? Why so serious about it? And here, I think, is a, is a, is a very telling uh, uh, mashal, parable. Rabbi Chia Bar Abba said in the name of Rabbi Yochan, it is the way of the world that a king and a matron are having a discussion. And one who sticks their head in, are they not liable for death? Thus Shabbat is a matter between Israel and God, as it says, between me and the children of Israel. Thus any non-Jew who puts himself between them before he accepts circumcision, meaning converts, is obligated for the death penalty. Here, Shabbat is not an expression of nature. This is the, the height of the particularity of Shabbat. Shabbat is an expression of this loving covenant, a moment of intimacy between a particular person in the Midrash, in the parable, the person being B'nai Yisrael, and the Kaddish Baruch Hu, and God. It's a, a moment of intimacy, of love, of privacy, meant to be kept only by the Jews and not by other people. Uh, and therefore, anybody who walks in, it's as if as they're walking in on the moment of God and the people of Israel uh, making love. Uh, and, and, and that's something that you, if you did that to the king and his matron, you would be obligated for the death penalty. Um, 
where do we go with all of these? Where do I see all of these texts going? Um, I think when we look at the world in which we live in, Shabbat has, through Christianity, become somewhat internet, uh, uh, universal. Most people in the Western world, I'm speaking most people in the Western world, at least it's considered desirable, in some places a human right, for people to have a day off. Uh, and I think that when we think about Shabbat as Jews, often we're thinking, at least the Jews that I speak to a lot, that universal sense of Shabbat. What does Shabbat mean? Shabbat means a day in which I don't go to work. I don't, um, I cease doing the things that I do during the rest of the week that, um, that uh, give me trouble, that keep me up at night, that are physically demanding, that are engaged in the productive labor, whatever it is, labor that I may be doing. Um, and that, both for Jews, I think, and for non-Jews as well, is a very universal sense of Shabbat. Uh, now, admittedly, not everybody has a right to this throughout all of the Western world, but I think when I, th when I think about what did the Jews bring to the world, that would be a right, an expectation, a demand that I think that some of those texts are saying Jews have brought to the world. That every human being deserves a day off. Human beings are not meant to be creating machines and never cease creating. We're not like, I don't know, like animals that can work all seven days of the week and don't really particularly seem to need a day off. We're meant to be ceasing, and all the things like Heschel talks about and Sachs talks about, to uh, remove ourselves from dominance, from wealth, from economic success, from mastery of the world, and to sit back and to be a little bit like that Sambat Yon River and just <coughs> cease flowing one day of the week, like, the, like nature. But I think the place where we trip up... Um, a lot of Jews is that there's also that particular covenantal loving side of Shabbat that is very, very particular to the Jews um, and doesn't translate, and neither do I feel that it should be translated to the rest of the world. Um, the quote I brought from Ignatius, which I don't know exactly what century this is in, but no one knows really, talks about some strange things that Jews do, such as preparing their food the day before, such as uh, using lukewarm drinks. Right? You can't heat up your water all that well on Shabbat. Uh, walking within a prescribed space, meaning you can't go wherever you want on Shabbat. Um, then he refer refers to finding delight in dancing. It sounds like they did some dancing in the synagogue. But there are a whole host, and everybody here knows of these things, a host of very particular types of observance that don't strike me as something that needs to be part of a universal Shabbat, and I think puzzle many Jews who come from non-religious backgrounds. Uh, I think probably all of you have faced this. You can understand why you shouldn't go to work on Shabbat. That makes intuitive sense in a universal way. It's harder to understand why I shouldn't, for instance, uh, go to the golf course, which it's fun for some people, not for me. Um, uh, or, or engage in other types of leisurely activity that are, are not work. Uh, they may involve electric, electric, electricity, they may involve travel, traveling to the beach. Um, these are fun activities that sound to most Jews like, why should they be part of this Genesis, this Breshi Shabbat? They're rest. I'm not working when I go play golf or when I go to the beach. But there's something else, I think, to Shabbat beyond that universal Shabbat, both for the world, where I don't think it's necessarily applicable, and for Jews especially. That there's this idea of intimacy, of covenant, of particularity, of something that we cease doing, and instead, what are we doing? We're worshiping, we're studying, we're spending time with our own tight-knit community, we're spending time with our family, that goes beyond the simple notion of rest. Um, and I think that, that, to me, is a little bit of a, of a resolution between the universal Shabbat and the covenantal <coughs> particular Shabbat. That there are two different kinds of Shabbat, both in the ones we experience and in the ones we should be advocating for the rest of the world. 
Um, when it comes to non-Jewish labor on Shabbat, maybe we'll, we'll end with this to get back where we started. I, I, it doesn't. I'm less. Un, I'm, that's my, I'm not uncomfortable with a non-Jew turning off and on a light on Shabbat, because for non-Jews that's not a particular form. It's not really labor to turn off and on a light. It does make me feel highly uncomfortable that the janitor has to come in and work on Shabbat. Because for him, that's a day of work. Cleaning up, uh, this doesn't happen to my shul here, but cleaning up, turning on the lights is not such a big deal. But having to come and put a day of work in on Shabbat makes me feel uncomfortable because that would be a breach of the universal Shabbat. Uh, there are some things, and I don't know if this, how it plays out in halakha, but there are some things where I just think that most people would consider them simple activities. The fact that Jews don't do them is really has nothing to do with rest. Uh, and they don't take any effort. They don't, uh, you know, for the non-Jew carrying that person's coins home, it doesn't bother me so much. It's not, um, it's not something that he's working for. Yes, he's carrying. But just carrying some coins isn't a particularly highly difficult form of labor. So what? So he carries the coins and we don't. There's something particular about Shabbat that I observe that other people don't observe. But when it comes to uh, real work, which, again, it's hard to define what exactly the border is there between real work and simply transgressions of Shabbat, but it is there, I believe. Every Jew feels it. Putting something into a Kli Shani is actually more work than putting it in a Kli Rishon, for, uh, for example. Sometimes Shabbat actually causes us to have to work a little harder to get something done, because that's, it's not part of this universal Shabbat, it's part of this particular covenantal version of Shabbat. Um, I don't, again, have the exact borders of where I would feel comfortable with non-Jews working. I think, uh, Mimi, your question about the difference between being a small community versus a dominant community, being in the land of Israel versus being outside of the land of Israel. There are major questions there. Uh, how does a, a state run itself without working on Shabbat is a huge question. Um, what things, something that's been troubling Israeli society for a very long time, is what things should be uh, not open on Shabbat and what things should be open on Shabbat. There may be some sense that uh, a universal Shabbat should mean, and I think Israeli society sometimes goes in that way, that uh, businesses, for instance, are closed, but mikamot bilui, places of uh, bars and, and, and uh, movie theaters and theaters can be open. Of course, some people have to work there on Shabbat, which is part of the issue that Israel faces. Um, but I think it's a helpful way of thinking about our particular Shabbat experience and also how we relate to non-Jews. Thinking about the non-Jewish world as well, I think it's very um, useful to think perhaps of the presence or how, how uh, big of a place in the, uh, I can't think of the word in English, uh, majority, majority, majority society, 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 society mm -hmm. um, takes in Europe. Sunday is, a mu is, is much more Sunday in Europe than it is in the United States, for instance. And even like, you know, hardcore leftist workers' parties like the fact that, I mean, they don't like that it's on Sunday, but they, you know, at most most businesses are closed. Restaurants are open, public transportation operates, and there's debate about that. But I think that's a, you know, if we're talking about this in a legitimate way, that probably is the kind of dynamic that I think you're talking about here. What is the, I mean, if you have janitorial staff come in on Shabbat, but then they, that there's no legally mandated Sunday time off, then they really, they're working on Shabbat too. They don't, they don't have their own Sunday. I mean, you mean if somebody, somebody, in Europe it would be different. They would, they come in and work, but Sunday is no work. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would argue that the janitor in the synagogue, if he has Sunday off, likelihood, and he's not Jewish, likelihood, that's the day he wants to spend with his family. Correct. The mm -hmm. fact that he works on Saturday, you know, in some ways shouldn't bother me because he has Sunday off. It is a universalist kind of day. You know, he's not giving, he doesn't have Tuesday off when his family's all at other jobs. He has Sunday off, maybe not always, right? But, but, uh, but he has a day off, and, and there's something I think probably important about mass numbers of people having the same day off. 
if you have a day off that nobody else has off, so you're kind of, you lost that sense of community of, of leisure is usually done with other people. At least it's time stuff with other people. Um, so maybe in that sense, and this is, you know, it doesn't matter if a non-Jew working for a Jew, as long as he gets, she gets a day off, does it really matter if it has to be Saturday? And I think to a certain extent, no. Um, that person has a human right to one day off. By the way, it's not two days off. We forget that in America, as nice as it is to have Saturday and Sunday off, the Torah does not advocate two days off. The Torah advocates one day off. So I would like to have another day off too, but uh, that doesn't really work that way. Um, but it's something to think about. Um, what about if it doesn't work out in the same day? What about in Israel is a big question, where there are people that have to work on Shabbat, the essential activities on Shabbat. I personally think that some of those activities should be done by Jews, and a lot of them are done by Jews. Um, but uh, don't, we've got some of the modern problems now, uh, for now. Other thoughts? Getting back to the city, yeah. since I, I experienced it a little bit, it's interesting that um, the activities that the Shabbos Goy did originally were turning on the lights, which were the Tzorech Datin, and making sure the heat was on, which was um, uh, protection of life. And then you see in American synagogues, these things expanded to obscene, obscene levels. Yeah, but they already started, the borders were already there in, in, in early Ashkenaz. Right, um, so that debate uh, about what you're allowed to have a nod you do and not, and not do has been debated for over a thousand years. Uh, and rabbis often try to say no, you're not allowed to do that. And people making this sort of instinctual uh, uh, difference, which is what uh, Jacob Katz, a famous historian from Hebrew University, called a ritual instinct. The ritual instinct said that there's a big difference between me doing something with my finger and me telling somebody else to do something. And Jews allowed themselves to tell other non-Jews to tell non-Jews to do things because they felt. It, didn't, it made a big difference. Even though rabbis kept saying, no, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. So you have a little bit of that echo now, maybe not exactly with rabbis, but halacha saying you're not allowed to do this. And Jews saying, look, if I can tell them to turn on the lights, what's the difference between turning on the lights and making some coffee? I know you can make a halachic difference, but it's hard for people to see that. But I'm, I'm trying to get back to something kind of like a, 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 a way of looking at each malacha or each kind of act, and act, asking ourselves, is that part of the universal experience of Shabbat, or is that part of the particular experience of Shabbat? I think that once you have the, a person who's working at synagogue on Shabbat, in his perspective, turning off and on the lights is no different than turning off and on the, 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 the coffee urn. It's the same exact thing. He doesn't, he doesn't feel like the coffee urn is a lot of work, and, uh, and uh, the lights aren't. It's all the same thing. He's there working on Shabbat. He's not home with his family, and he's working on Shabbat. In that sense, again, I know that in a halachic sense it makes a difference. In an experiential sense, it doesn't seem to make any difference from him, from his perspective. I'm interested, because you kind of touched on this a little bit before. I don't know if this was your intention, but I'm interested. Like, if we're talking about universal elements of Shabbat, or even like, what does it look like to universalize the Shabbat to a certain extent? Like, something like Kiddush, it's not just like a mitzvah, a ritual, it's like it adds holiness to the experience. Is there a way, like, I don't know, maybe based on Jewish sources or maybe just based on a modern day innovation to like take the essence of some of these, you know, more ritual elements of Shabbat and not, not do them the same, but like kind of make something that could have the equivalent impact for non-Jews that wanted to have a day of rest that wasn't just like cessation from labor that also involved. Cultivation of Some kind of worship. I mean, that's what the Christians, the least that I, most Christian least thinkers seem to think that their Shabbat is not just a day of rest, but it's a day of rest in order to do something, which for them is to work, um, which is basically Le Kadesh. I mean, what is Le Kadesh? It's to return your focus to holiness. So I think in, at least in Christian, uh, in religious Christian thinkers' minds, I'm not an expert on it. The answer is, yeah, it's just it would be for their particular religion. I don't know how to do that in a totally secular sense, maybe another question. But the way it worked out for Christianity was that the Sabbath day, which turned into Sunday based on uh, Jesus' resurrection, wasn't just a day to take a day off. They actually thought that it was no value to taking a day off. That's just idleness. 
Um, but to take a day off to do something with it, to worship God, had, had value. Um, so, in that sense, they developed, I think, their own particular version of that. Uh, you know, we, in other words, their own particular intimate covenantal, I don't know if the word covenant is the right word, their own particular uh, experience of their intimate relationship with, with their version of God occurred on Sunday as well. Um, and that, that's Christianity. I don't know enough about Islam to know anything about Shabbat in Islam. I was said Kaddish because I was pressed for an example. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, um, Kiddish. Uh, I think it's, this reminds me of another kind of conversation I've had at the, in the prior years at school around like monotheism particularly, about being a Jewish universe, like essentially it's a particularly Jewish thing at certain times that we have to somehow make universal. And the rest of the, the world contemporaneously says, hmm, that sounds like a personal problem. Um, and I wonder a little bit, I, I feel echoes of that in this conversation as well, around like, why does universalism matter to us? Ought it matter to others? And why, is, why might there be a difference? For example, like, why, it, certainly I thank also, I, I thank God for Shabbat, I also thank unions for a weekend, but also all, having access to work for lots of people is deeply important. So, like, why can't, in a situation where I might be in shul and see someone else who's not Jewish doing work in the shul, that might be like, oh, he doesn't have an experience of Shabbat on Shabbat. Um, might the answer be, that sounds like, a, like, if you're worried about that, that sounds like a personal problem. This person has work. Um, or necessarily saying, like, yeah, essentially the universalism, is that for us to reckon, or is that something that, are we okay with that being, like, a Jewish universalism? Does that make sense? So, okay, the next, the last step. Um, like, why are we, like, why can't I see someone doing work on Shul on Shabbat and saying, wow, uh, someone say, I, I'm holding my people in my life who, who have worked in synagogues, and I've talked to them, they're right. Jehovah's Witnesses or something, they don't necessarily view time in the same way and say, cool, I'm glad they're here. Right. So uh, maybe part of what you're asking, there's more than one universal value. There may be a universal value in not having to work seven days a week for your entire life. There also may be a universal value in making sure that people have work that they can perform so that they can earn money to provide for their own families and to ensure an economically successful, broadly successful society are probably like both universal values in which we can <laughs> conflict yeah. with each other on Shabbat and... and, and um, so that's, I, you know, I don't think it's sort of why should Jews care about the rest of the world. It's more of there are, when we look at the rest of the world, there are conflicting values sometimes. And uh, then we'd have to address um, what to do with those conflicting values. To, to comment maybe on Max's thing about, about Sunday, I do think that in America there's, because of this intense commercialism and the selling, 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 selling all the time, there probably is a push, and that's probably why, I'm not an expert, but why Sunday seems to have deteriorated. And while I, as an observant Jew, do enjoy the fact that stores are all open on Shabbat, that does, on Sunday, excuse me, it does mean that somebody's always at the mall, or I, I can't say on the mall, but always at these stores, they're always open 24 hours a day, all the time, constantly selling something, there may be some kind of universal value there and saying, like, this is not a Jewish value. People deserve a day off. Now, maybe they all do get a day off. But I would imagine there are places uh, in America where people don't all get a day off. Josh. Moving on from that, I, I was looking at Brother on the sheet. Yeah. I had uh, uh, Ethan Tucker. Yeah, I quoted a couple of pieces. Of Maybe we need Gentiles for Shabbat. Yeah. And that kind of presents a different model of universal Shabbat, where everyone has their particular Shabbat, but yeah. fill, fills in the gaps for others. Um, and something I like, <coughs> we've tried a couple of times in Berlin, yeah. it's uh, over Christmas, Jews go and volunteer in places in, uh, in soup kitchens and refugee shelters to give others a day off, because um, that's a time when Jews should be, should be filling in the gaps for, for other people's Shabbat. So you can have different particular uh, expressions of Shabbat while holding it as a universal value. That's 
I wasn't sure what exactly what he meant by that one. But there was something there that like could be understood in that way, and there was something there that could be understood um, more. I felt like not as comfortable with like that we we were like. Gentiles become an instrument through which we observe Shabbat, and it was more of an instrumental way of looking at, um, at Gentiles. If you present it as a, um, as a uh, you know, dude study, kind of like a two-way street, and that we all need each other in some kind of symbiotic relationship in order to observe our particular conversation with our God or our version of God, that makes some more sense to me. Because then it's presented in a very symbiotic way. If it's just, we really, these laws are impossible for us to keep unless we use Gentiles, it strikes me as something's wrong there. Um, and that if it's not more than just like, oh, I happen to be there and I can't carry my coins. All right, that happens sometimes. But if you have to shape your world so that I can't keep Shabbat without Gentiles, then something strikes me as wrong there. things one or tell to that um with the coin example there has to be some sort of trust between them he's yes. giving you this wallet right so i feel yeah. like there's something powerful in that that they're yes. giving their wallet to a gentile to trust them to hold the money and not steal it until after shabbat um another thing is i remember hearing that in eastern europe there was a practice of um there would be the shabbos goy who would go from house to house who would just add fire to, or add wood to the fire and stoke the fire for people, you know, and people would, it was like an expected thing, people would pay this person before Shabbat, um, and so they would go from house to house, and then in the meantime, they would stay, eat a few cookies, drink tea with people, and it was this relationship that was built between this non-Jew and Jewish families in the town. Yeah. There's something really Oh, there's some nice uh, side benefits there, I mean... Uh, we could present many, I, we could talk about the interrelations between Jews and non-Jews and those kinds of atmospheres. Um, there's no doubt that that would have built some good relationships. I mean, I don't want to push this analogy, but there were slaves that had great relationships with their masters too. And, uh, I'm not saying it's the exact same thing. There's a border, right? I mean, the, the, some of those are very positive relationships, but there's, there's two sides to that, that equation. Um, uh, so... I want, I'm thinking of this more than I like. In reality, reality, reality is going to impose its own necessities. But at least in the way I think, I'm more interested in the way that Jews conceive of Shabbat, and that if Jews, I think, would realize that there's an element of Shabbat that is not so universal, that is very particular, and therefore, it's not this I just an idea of have to rest on Shabbat. There's more, I think, to Shabbat than just, I'm not working. There's that, that image of the intimate covenant between this particular people and God. Um, and in that case, it's not just about the laws of nature, it's also about, um, about a covenant. All right, I wanna stop here. It's, it's getting a little late. Um, thank you all. I'm like, this is something I've been thinking about for a little bit. And I thank everybody for, for listening. Um, why don't we, I think most Talmud Shirin want to do Chavruta now. I don't think we have time for Shirin. It's too much listening one day. So I think they'll probably should take a few minutes of relaxing, getting yourself something to drink or eat, and then each break up in the Chavruta and use the time to do it. Yeah, well, we'll, you can take a 10 minute break and then we'll meet together and Okay, my class, I think we're going to keep going with Chavruta. In my class, I have new material for you. So. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.